This is a Kelly's Angels production. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Mulholland and welcome to The Upbeat, a podcast about perseverance and hope from Kelly's Angels. Since this is our first episode, I want to give a little backstory on Kelly's Angels. It's an organization we founded in memory of my wife, Kelly, who passed away from breast cancer in 2007. She was just 37 and our children, Connor and McKenna, were just seven and five at that time. Kelly's Angels provides financial grants to families in New York's capital region who've lost a parent or child to illness or who are currently battling a life-threatening condition. Perhaps more importantly, we support families by letting them know they're not alone. And that's where the idea of this podcast was born. The Upbeat Podcast is our way of acknowledging that life can be hard and painful at times. Whether it's the loss of a loved one or a job or a divorce, we want to help each other through tough times. I'm really excited to be hosting this podcast because it brings together my life's calling, telling stories as a news reporter, with my life's purpose in helping other families like mine smile again after experiencing loss. We're so glad you've joined us for our our first episode. The Upbeat is made possible by the generosity of our sponsors. Special thanks to our media partner, 32 Mile Productions. This episode of The Upbeat is sponsored by the Bobert Family Fund, Stewart's Shops, and the Dake Family. Our guest on The Upbeat is Dr. Jerry Florio, a clinical health psychologist at the C.R. Wood Cancer Center at Glens Falls Hospital in Glens Falls, New York. Dr. Florio, thank you for joining us on The Upbeat. Thank you so much for having me here, Mark. What is your role? My role is to help uh, people who are being treated and their families living with or beyond cancer. So I see many people while they are getting treatment to try to help them to um, cope with the, the, the stress and the distress associated with that. I will see family members of people on treatment. And then I see a lot of people after treatment. You know, there's times where I see more people after treatment. You know, During treatment, people are kind of in this, lack of a better term, a good soldier mode. Yeah. You know, they're, they're going through, they're fighting the yeah. fight, doing the next thing. It's empowering, even though the treatments are difficult. They're being seen regularly and told they're okay. Treatment ends, and all of a sudden, um, it's a new reality. And many things in life have changed. You have to absorb to those change and get build your confidence back that you can be okay. As, as you said, you said good soldier. People do often approach the diagnosis from that perspective, right? I'm going to get through this. Yep. Uh, I'm going to be fine, and, and we're going to power. They, they view it as a battle, right? Yes. And then they reach a point, maybe, that they realize they can't do the battle alone. I try to kind of introduce myself to people uh, because, you know, when they're going through, when they're at a medical facility doing their medical treatment, uh, people aren't always, you know, um, open to the idea of seeing a psychologist. I hear, when I walk into a room, I hear often, do they, people think I'm crazy? <laughs> you know, um, and I think that if I meet them early on just to introduce myself, at some point in the, you know, in this whole um, process, people hit a wall. And then it's a different thing to, you know, more, I think more people will agree to talk to Jerry than to a psychologist. So if I've met them, they see that I don't have three heads, you know, um, I, I think they're more open to, to do, you know, to seeing. I can speak support. personally from from the value that you bring to the diagnosis. Uh, my late wife, Kelly, who you counseled, and then you ended up counseling us. You ended up counseling Connor and McKenna as well. So I'll, I'll be forever grateful for how you helped us when Kelly was ill, when Kelly passed, and those, that, that difficult time. Um, you mentioned, you said Jerry. Yes. You, you identify yourself as Jerry, and I remember that being helpful because you think you want to talk to our doctor, you right. think another person in the long white lab coat with a stethoscope and very clinical, but how important is that to show your humanity to people who you're helping? I personally think it's very important. I, you know, people are on a journey, and I want to kind of be seen as someone who can be uh, you know, a resource or a companion for part of that. The things I've learned from people that I can then pass on to them. The things I've learned from my training that I can pass on to them. Until I've got, some, you know, a connection with someone, it doesn't matter what I, you know, what I have to offer. Um, they're not, you know, they may not be open to it. So I think it's critically important. 
And you go through these experiences with people. You become fond of the people. You have a connection with them as they're battling. Sometimes they're lost. Sure. What are your recommendations? There's no magic bullet. I understand that, and I think everyone understands that. But you've seen so much loss through your 22 years um, as a psychologist and 20 years at Glens Falls Hospital. What are, you, what, are your, what are your recommendations for people who have, have suffered a loss? I think grieving is w one of the most difficult human experiences we ever encounter. Um, I think it is something that we does not feel normal uh, when it is happening. It's like being injected with the strongest emotion that you can imagine. It, you know, even when people are expecting that someone, you know, on hospice or expecting that someone is going to, to die, when it actually happens, there's still some shock. There's still some disbelief. I don't think we can ever be prepared. And it's overwhelming. And I think that um, there are just certain things that can really help people navigate that storm. One is to just recognize that you have, you can't avoid grief. You have to feel that loss. You have to experience that loss and all the strong emotions, the physical changes, the, the thinking changes, the emotional changes and behavioral changes. Um, and, and getting some you know, getting some education about what grief is like because it doesn't feel normal. And people feel like I'm losing my, I hear people say, I feel like I'm losing my mind. I feel like I'm not coping with this well. And educating people about grief helps them to see it's hard because it's hard. It's not hard because you're not doing it well. It's not hard because there's something better you should be doing. It's hard because it's hard. Um, I think that expression is really important. And emotions and energy, and you have to get that energy out. Verbal expression can be good, but it's only one, you know, it's only one form. I think, you know, creative expression through writing, through art, musical expression through, you know, um, through, through songs, physical expression, through um, exercise, or just screaming or yelling, um, getting... F yeah, that's okay, right? Oh, I mean, it's, it's more than... It's, it, it, it's necessary. It can feel really good. Um, I ask people where they, you know, who, who say they, they do sometimes yell or scream. I, I ask them, where do you usually do that? The two most popular answers I get are the car and the shower. So, um, <laughs> yeah. But it can be really, really helpful. Comfort. We need comfort. Um, we, we, we need to realize that we're not um, al alone in this you know, people ask me oftentimes, how can I support someone I know who's grieving? And I, I, I you know, what should I say? People always say, what should yeah. I say? And I, I usually tell people, you know, what you say is less important than your presence. Just be with people. Uh, many grieving people will give you, I don't know if you had this experience, but they will give you a list of the unhelpful things <laughs> that people say. Um, and I will ask people, you know, what are some of the helpful things that people say? And they say, you know, it's really not, it's really not what they say. Yeah. They say, I'm sorry. They say, I don't know what to say. People say, that's, sometimes that's the most helpful thing to hear. It's just an honest, I don't know what to say. But they remember that they're there. They remember that they sit with them, they send cards, they make phone calls. They remember that they remember them. Um, and, and, and that brings, you know, that brings comfort. I remember that. I do remember that. And until you had brought it up, I hadn't. But I, I was thinking about uh, the services for Kelly. And I think there were, honestly, maybe a couple thousand people who came through over a couple of days. And uh, people would, would mostly say, I'm sorry. And some would say, I don't know what to say. And that is... That's refreshing to hear because none of us know knows yeah. what to say. But I do remember one person in particular who came through and said, uh, "Mark, you don't know me very well." She leaned forward and whispered in my ear, and, "But we met one time, and, and I'm not going to identify her." But she said, "I've got something in my pocket for you." I'm like, "I'm sorry, what? What? You've got something in your pocket?" She's like, "It's a Xanax. It'll help you." <laughs> I, 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 I don't remember taking it, but I will always remember that she did that. But. Um, yeah, we don't know what to say, and we don't know, uh, we don't know what people want to hear either. I guess, but you but know, and sometimes not knowing what to say, people stay away and they avoid because of that yes. anxiety, and that's why I, you know, I really try to encourage. Just say, I don't know what to say. And time, um, the, the, one of the more difficult things about early grief is that 
it feels like it will always fe- be this way. Yeah. You know, and time changes grief, and grief, you know, heals. I'm not a fan of closure and the word closure. Loss changes a life forever. Rather than closure, I think people need to, people do, they heal, they find a way to strike that balance between staying connected to the person they loved and lost and f- moving forward through life. Support for The Upbeat comes from 32 Mile Productions, a full-service video production agency that specializes in uncovering stories to create meaningful content that is compelling and memorable. Learn more at 32mile.com. The Bobert Family Fund, which supports charitable organizations that efficiently use the resources they have to make a disproportional impact on the world around them. The Digg Family and Stewart's Shops, an employee and family-owned convenience store chain serving eastern upstate New York and southwestern Vermont. Hi, I'm Mark Mulholland, and you're listening to The Upbeat, a podcast about perseverance and hope from Kelly's Angels. I recently sat down with Kristen Hansen of Clifton Park, New York, who lost her husband Keith to cancer in 2010. We talked about grief and how overwhelming it can be. You miss Keith every day. The girls miss Keith every day. You miss having the him there for the girls every day. Mm-hmm. I'm sure too. What What was the worst part? What was the What was the Do you Do you remember a time that was that was worse than any other? There was a day, and I don't. It must have been a few months after. My mom left, you know, back in summer of 2011. I remember going out in the living room and the girls were out there and just one of those days that I just couldn't stop crying. And I remember like literally falling to the floor in the living room. I'm laying on the living room floor and I could not physically, physically could not get up. I couldn't stop crying. I just, I could, I just remember saying, I remember saying like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to stop it. And in my mind, I'm saying to myself, Chris, you got to put yourself together. You have a six-year-old and a four-year-old sitting here. But I couldn't. I could not stop. My kids were like, you know, I told them just to call my mom. So they called my mom, who luckily had the phone number to my one of my best friends here, and they called her. She came over, got the girls, and brought them to her house. I vividly remember laying on the floor, just crying and physically not being able to get up and thinking, oh, my God, I'm like I'm losing it. Um, but how you am got I going to do it. this? You, you, I did. It wasn't um, easy. No, my mom, my mom did come up. I mean, I'm grateful that um, I have, my mom was able to do that. But like you said, I got through it. You know, uh, that was probably one of the lowest lows in the 10 years. We're back with Dr. Jerry Florio, a clinical psychologist. We heard Kristen describe a time when her grief took a physical toll. What about the physical side of grief? What's going on in the body? Grief hurts. You know, I mean, it physically hurts. Um, it is a stress at its most, you know, basic survival um, level. And so the, the body's stress response gets activated, and it is a state of arousal. When we have to fight or flee, that's a helpful response. But when that response is on over time, we know that it starts to break down our physical health. Um, and so people will end up having more digestive problems, breathing problems, pain problems. Stress breaks down our immunity, so have more difficulty fighting infections. Sometimes you don't have the energy to take care of yourself. Yeah. So you have more physical challenge and you're not taking care of yourself as well. And so people, you know, people can easily um, get, get sick, exacerbate chronic conditions. Those are great insights, Jerry. This podcast strives to help people overcome grief and adversity. Can you talk about the role resilience plays in all that? Being able to get back up when we get knocked down. You know, resilience is a very important part, I think, of a very important life skill. People think that resilience is a trait, a personality trait that we're born with. And I'm either resilient or I'm not. But studies show, and, and, and I have seen, you can learn to become more resilient. We can learn how to bounce back more, how not to be, you know, as overwhelmed when the difficult things in life happen. How do you? How do you? There's, four really, there's four keys to, to developing um, resilience. One is to um, maintain connections. That sense of we are in this together. Yeah. Um, you know, helps us. Two is to maintain your uh, health, 
your physical and mental health, to be able to cope with things, we have to be healthy. The third thing is to kind of be mindful of how we think about things, to really try to move away from negative thinking and embrace positive thinking. Look for um, some, you know, some aspect of a situation that might be a gain. Coach yourself through, this is tough, but I've gotten through tough times before really focusing on positive things, and then finding meaning. You know, just like in grief, people who find meaning, people who, who try to say, okay, this is an experience um, that I, I didn't choose, I didn't want, uh, but can I learn something about myself? Can I learn something about life? Can I learn something about others? Can I take something that I've experienced here and turn it into the benefit of others. Those kinds of things help people to become more resilient. And those all apply not just to loss of someone. They, they apply to, the, well, perhaps the loss of a job, the loss Most of a, lo, a divorce, uh, a, a, a loss of a relationship, right. all sorts of, it's, it's not just resilience following grief. No, and there are many types of grief. We grieve many losses. You know, I, I mean, people understand the concept of grief uh, through, you know, as my reaction to the death of someone. But grief is all around us. And, and, and I, it's my belief that in the last seven months in this pandemic, one of the prominent things has been grief. We have lost life as we knew it. We have lost connection. We have lost activity. And um, we're trying to get, we've lost a sense of normal. Um, and, and, and that's a real loss to be grieved. And we're, we, we're, we're doing that while we're trying to cope with a new normal. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, I mean, that's... Is it more important then, now, more than ever, to follow the advice you just offered, that, that to, to take care of yourself, to I, maintain a routine, to um, all, of, all of those... Yes, I think so. I, I think it's very important. You know, every, every medical pandemic has been followed by a mental health pandemic. Um, they're stressful. Uh, situations and 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 long prolonged stress can grind us down. Um, so it, it is very helpful. It, 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 it's critical, I think, to to try to do all you can to maintain um, maintain a sense of being resilient. Anything that that we haven't talked about that you would like to like people to be left with as it relates to overcoming adversity, knowing that there is some light at the end of what can feel like a pretty dark tunnel. Some sort of spiritual um, connection, some sort of connection to something bigger than ourselves, yeah. whether it, it be something spiritual, whether it be an ideal or a value. Um, I, I, I think that that helps us tremendously in um, times of uh, great challenge because we can draw strength from that. We draw strength from that sense of connection, especially in situations where people don't have any control. Yeah. We, you know, I like control. I, I'm a control enthusiast. You know, <laughs> I, I, I like to have it. And when I don't have control, it's easy to feel powerless. But when you think about it, they're not the same. You know, having control is the ability to dictate an outcome. Yeah. Having power is the ability to keep going. You know, and so when I can't dictate the outcome, sometimes plugging into that thing that's bigger than me, plugging into connecting and, you know, and, and getting energy from people, that gives us the power to keep, you know, to keep going. Dr. Jerry Florio, the clinical health psychologist at the C.R. Wood Cancer Center at Glens Falls Hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Great to Pleasure. talk with you. Great talking with you. If you like listening to The Upbeat, leave us a review where you listen to podcasts. Join us next time when we're joined by my friend and fellow journalist, John Gray. We'll be talking about the power of storytelling in John's book that's helping children who are coping with loss. Until next time, I'm Mark Mulholland. Take care and stay on The Upbeat. Special thanks to our media partner, 32 Mile Productions, for their help in recording our episodes. Emily Yan, a graphic designer and art director who invested her time and talent to create our podcast logo videographer, editor, and Kelly's Angels board member, Lou Graff. Coordinating producer and Kelly's Angels board member, Jenny Sperano. And all the volunteer Kelly's Angels board members who had a hand in making this podcast possible. Thanks for listening to The Upbeat.